Good morning. This is Steve from Southern Illinois again, and this is a companion piece to the GPS Gospel Episode 5, uh, along with Bobby Gage, that was just streamed uh, on my Facebook page, Dealing with Interference. The question we're exploring is, what breaks our connection with God? So, Let's ask the Spirit to guide us, and we'll get started. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your grace in our lives. Thank you that we are not alone. Be with us today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The traditional sequence goes like this. When we go to the Bible to find out what separates us from God, um, We end up with a sequence like this, okay? Isaiah 15, 5, uh, 1 and 2. Let me grab my Bible again. Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2 is a classic. Behold. The Lord's hands is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear from hear you. The classical answer as to what breaks our connection with God is our sins. And the psalmist said, If I behold iniquity in my in my light, in my heart, you will not hear me. And the answer uh, typically is uh, what's voiced in Acts chapter 2, uh, verses 37 and 38. This is the, uh, an account, part of the account of the day of Pentecost. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. The answer uh, to the broken connection that we have with God is repentance, baptism, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, some people would add on a third, a third element here, uh, voiced in Matthew chapter three and verse eight. John the Baptist is speaking to to religious people who have come out to hear him, and he's he's just said some really harsh things to them, you know, calling them a brood of vipers and asking them, who, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And then he says, bring forth therefore fruits, meat for repentance. Our sins separate us from God. Repentance, baptism, the gift of the Holy Spirit can reconnect us. But unless that reconnection changes our lives and, and um, brings forth fruit, it's not effective. That's the, um, that's the typical answer, and I, I really don't have a problem with that. I, I, I believe in conviction and repentance and reformation. But when I read what Jesus taught, um, I think there's a broader picture here. So today I'd like us to, to turn to Matthew chapter 13. I'm not going to read the whole passage. Um, more I'm going to paraphrase it. But I would encourage you, Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 23, is Jesus' parable of the sower uh, planting his field. And I think it has a lot to say to our the, the, the question that we're dealing with of what breaks our connection with God. A sower went forth to sow. <clears throat> now we don't sow when we're planting, 
We, we, we put each seed exactly where we want it. But sowing, you took the seeds and you threw them out into the air and, and spread them that way. So the sower went forth to sow, and the seeds fell in different places. Some of them fell on the path next to the field, and birds flew down and snatched them away. Some of the seeds fell on stony ground, and when they started growing, there wasn't enough soil for them to put down roots deeply, and when the sun began, when the heat came and the hot season came, the soil dried out and the plants died. Some of the seeds fell among thorns and thistles, and as they tried to grow, the, the weeds around them choked them out. And some seeds fell on good soil and produced a good crop. If you've been to church most of your life, like I have, you've heard this story again and again and again. And I've almost always heard this story told with the focus being on the soil, the hard soil that Jesus said was people who lack understanding of the gospel, uh, lack of understanding brought about by hard living, uh, stony soil, shallow roots, hearts that are that don't really let the gospel seep into them and, and change them. And they turn into fair weather Christians. When when everything's going well, they're, they, 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 they're happy to be Christians. But when things get difficult or they're asked to make sacrifices, then it's a different story. And the weedy soil where the cares and the temptations of this world um, crowd out the effect of the gospel. That's that's the message that's always been, and, and underlying that was the message, be good soil. But how? Now, last week I told you that I approached the Bible from the historical, grammatical, hermeneutic method, way of, of interpreting the Bible. And when we look at history, when we look at history, we find out that in Christ's day, in Galilee, where he was talking to the people, they had developed a highly efficient system of dry farming. Dry farming doesn't use irrigation, and it is it occurs in an in a area of the world where rainfall is marginal, barely sufficient for farming to occur. And the system that had been worked out in Palestine at that time was they built terraces along the hills uh, to and then hauled dirt up to, to deepen the soil so that it could hold more moisture. The terraces kept the soil in place and the soil kept the moisture in place. But the system that they had developed required five to seven plowings every year just to produce a single crop. And before every plowing, they had to go around with a hoe and dig out the large rocks in the soil that could break the plow. <clears throat> Even with all of these, these, all of these uh, adaptations, they could only grow a crop every other year, uh, or the soil would be exhausted. Now, they, they did use uh, manure and spread manure on the fields, but there wasn't enough manure to go on all of the fields. So if you had manure, you could grow a crop for a couple of years. Uh, but uh, if you didn't have manure, then you had to leave your field fallow. And because of the, the difficulty with um, having enough moisture, the farmers sowed their seed very sparsely. They didn't plant as heavily uh, as we did, do today, even in those parts of the world that don't use mechanical uh, planting systems. That's the historical background. Okay, <clears throat> Terraces to conserve the soil multiple plowings through the year, digging the stones out by hand, 
leaving the field fallow in between and, and putting few seeds out there. Every seed was precious. And when we look at the grammar, uh, you may remember from your English classes in school that the subject is a noun that controls the verb. Um, it's the active, uh, the active part of the sentence. Um, so what's the subject in this story? The sower went forth to sow and some seed fell. The subject is the sower. The sower went forth to sow. That's what the sower did. And what did he sow? He sowed seed. That's the object. That's, that's what is passive in, in the sentence. The sower, the active agent, sows the activity, the seed. So let's reframe this parable in modern terms. And let's see what insights we get from that. A farmer went out to plant his fields. This is a site that we see in southern Illinois frequently. A farm, a farm tractor, pass, tractor passing through town or us following it down the highway. A farmer went out to plant his fields and he planted some of the seed on the roadside. And he planted some of the seeds on the piles of rocks that had been taken out of the fields. And he planted some of the seeds in fields that had been left fallow so long that thorns and thistles and brambles were growing in them. On some of the seeds he planted in good soil. Now when, when I first looked at the historical context and I realized how labor intensive preparing the soil was for farm before farmers sow seeds, it made me think, you know what? I bet the audience that Jesus was talking to was convulsed with laughter. For us Christians that have heard this story over and over again, it's like, oh yeah, so it went forth, so da la la la. No, they're hearing this newly. They know how farmers work. Why is this farmer sowing his precious seed? on the path, on the roadside. Why is this farmer throwing seed into fallow fields? Why is this sower, sower sowing seeds in the rock piles at the edges of the field where he's dug out the rocks and piled them up? This sower, this farmer is absolutely crazy. I think that's what they were thinking. And Jesus used their laughter to drive home a message. But the subject of this parable was not the seed as we so often hear it. The subject was the sower, the farmer, who was responsible for where the seed went and the preparation of the soil. What breaks our connection with God? I think the traditional answer that sin breaks our connection with God is perfectly appropriate as far as it goes. But in Matthew, we learn that there are other things, things that get in the way. Okay? Um, <clears throat> as Jesus explained the parable to the disciples, he said that the seed that fell along the roadside fell on hearts in the lives of people who didn't take the time to understand the gospel. They just took a superficial, they wanted the quick answer. They just, give it to me, give it to me. Just, just spoon it out here and let me have the gospel so I can get on with my life. Okay. That kind of attitude that uh, life is where it's at and the gospel is just something we lay on top like frosting to make it look good uh, means that we really don't understand the gospel and it gets taken away from us. 
the stony ground, Jesus said, is people who 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 get the gospel, they understand it, and and, and they start growing spiritually, but they never put down roots. They too stay at a superficial level, and when trouble comes, when life gets difficult, or when people say, you actually believe that stuff? And raise questions that we have trouble answering? If our roots aren't deep, we get discouraged, and it breaks our connection with God. Thorns and thistles, Jesus said, represented two things. One was the cares of this world, the difficulties that we face every day. And the other was the deceitfulness of riches. Both of these are temptations. When life is difficult, we are tempted to blame God or to discard him entirely. When life is going great, we're tempted to feel like we don't need him and to start chasing the advantages that this world has. But where does this leave us? What, what does it provide us with? If those are the things that, that break our connection, what's the solution? Um, right, the traditional gospel says, repent, be baptized. But then Jesus tells this parable and he seems to put the onus all back on the farmer, the farmer who's supposed to prepare the field. If our connection with God is broken, did God let us down? Jesus told another parable. We're not going to go to it today, but it's a parable about a fig tree that wasn't bearing fruit. And the owner of the orchard came and said to the gardener, you know what? I've come here for three years and this fig tree still isn't producing fruit. Cut it down. But the gardener says, no, no, let's give it some time. And the gardener manures the soil around and digs the soil Okay, he takes care of the tree and nurtures it. And in my mind, that's the answer to our broken connection with God. You see, the Bible again and again tells us that we can't solve our spiritual problems. Only God can. So when my connection with God is broken, when I can't, don't feel like he is leading me, when I can't hear his voice, or when I pick up the Bible and it just doesn't make sense to me, the solution is not to go looking elsewhere for answers. The solution is simply to reach out to God and ask him to reconnect us. That's what I find in the word on this, on this, okay? I'm not saying I have the last word, but my friend, I have found in my personal life, in my personal experience, that if I will reach out to God, instead of trying to solve my problems on my own, answers come. Be safe, be prudent, my friends, but keep looking up. The morning cometh. I'll see you next week.